Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Poetry Square. Um, I'm Diane Funston, and I bring this show to you every third Thursday at this time, 7 p.m. And uh, I'm the Yuba Sutter Arts and Culture Poet in Residence. And we have a lot of fun every month bringing poets from basically all over the country now because we can on Zoom. And tonight is, is no different. Um, we have a poet who comes to you from my hometown, Rochester, New York. And I think I'll share some of my Rochester, New York poems because I grew up there. And we have a poet coming from Escondido, California, which is very close to San Diego. It's in San Diego County. And we have another poet who uh, lives in Philadelphia, also East Coast poet tonight. So we have two East Coasters and myself and another West Coaster. So welcome everyone to Poetry Square. And uh, I think I'll start us off with a poem that I call Home. And uh, it, it'll go like this. There are 2,618 miles separating me from home. Untold amounts of trees to that place now with fewer Kodak moments, certainly of my old street. It's a place where everyone knows what frozen custard is and cicada song, festival of lilacs, white hats and grandma brown's beans. The whirly gigs from maple trees still glide from branches and end up on children's noses. That I can even speak of home is remarkable. Too many between there and here and maybe not enough. Longing lingers between seasons, unharvested, whole and brief. We look backwards to explain our forward travel, make sense of lives lived and not lived, left behind, hanging from the ceiling like aged and drying beef. There is no attic here or cellar below, all lives lived on one level, fewer places to store memories, but they still fit nicely in the head that space that has room for everything. Photos and text, aromas and sound, chill of snow and icicles, song of the Mr. Softy truck, all locked in a private exhibition we still have the key for. And uh, summer back in Rochester, there is a, a amusement park called Seabreeze right on Lake Ontario. And one of my favorite rides that's been going since the early, early part of the 20th century is Jack Rabbit. It's a roller coaster, the old wooden clickety clack uh, roller coasters. And this is called For Jack Rabbit, a roller coaster. Over a century old, Skeletal bleached bones stretch over and under green treetops, reach upward as our arms do in ecstasy, plunging downward in a little death of inhibition. Freedom comes with a roar and a scream so loud no one can hear it and everyone can. The green caterpillar winds up and around down through valleys, up through peaks, the ride ends in the dark tunnel, like the unconscious or before birth or after death. What we exit only to beg entrance again. The green car ascends the first hill, climbing higher, mechanical fingers tease the wooden spine, clackety clack the creaking of childhood summers, let go in a whoosh of breathtaking awe. This is a memory made real again, taking the dare and riding it out, overlooking Lake Ontario, gray blue canvas horizon, looking down to childhood, or up toward heaven, 
without fear, riding in real time and coasting on memory, standing in line, awaiting another turn, another chance at the immortality of speed and suddenness of wood and rail, a time machine resurrecting youth again, round and round she goes, where will we be when she comes out of the tunnel? Who were you when you first went in? Over a century old, skeletal bleached bones stretch over and under green treetops, reach upward as our arms do in ecstasy, plunging downward in a little death of inhibition. Freedom comes with a roar and a scream so loud, no one can hear it and everyone can. And of course, um, upstate New York is also home to Niagara Falls, um, another place I love and um, have been there many, many times. And the Horseshoe Falls, um, for those who have never seen it, is just an amazing waterfall. So. This is called Horseshoe Falls. I stand before the behemoth, its smile toothless and wide, spans the face of a river. With gaping maw, danger pours along with fascination. The mesmerizing hiss, backlit with summer sunshine, I feel small as the little girl I was when we first met. Closer, it seems to whisper, a low tone beneath the roar of sound. No, I respond, mainly to myself. I still face the gleaming white grin, repetitive, seductive laughter, powerful urgency. We are so unequal in impact, in show, in experience. I rock back and forth on unsteady feet and wipe the moisture from my face as I pull away back from the grasp of Niagara. And uh, this is another memory poem. It's called Show and Tell. Mr. Softy drove up the street every day around seven o'clock Kids heard the song and like Pavlov's dogs began salivating. I, eight years old, another two years before I could cross the street, waited for the odd nights when the truck was on my side. I'd run into the house begging for the 15 cents for a cone. Do you think we're the Rockefellers made of money? More often than not, I'd tell my friends, I just didn't want ice cream. In the grass school playground, we played softball daily. I could hit, but never could run. Then once the ball went so far out, even a snail like me made a home run. My friends cheered, slapped my back, said maybe I wasn't worthless at this game. I held that pride for about 10 minutes. And then I heard my name, Diane, get your ass home now. Those dungarees are brand new. Now they're filthy. Take them off, take them down cellar, and soak them in the wash tub. My pride dissolved to tears. I winced at the slap when I walked past. Then get up here. I'll run the bathtub. Get your nightgown on after you're done outside today. Never allowed to sleep in. No Saturday cartoons until after lunch. Saturday was wash day. Hot water, Clorox, ringer washer, clothes hung on the line. Once, just hanging out hot white, white bleach shirts, my friend came to show me her jump rope. Just a minute, I want to go look. I left the shirt in the plastic hamper and ran. I was so engrossed in the sparkling jump rope you're not finished. I didn't hear the heavy footsteps, but felt the slap of the hot bleachy shirt across my head. You're not finished with the wash. Tell her to go home. 
my face wet from the shirt and hidden tears. Days later, after I joined in the jump rope game, everyone heard the story from my friend. Diane can't come out and play. She's locked up in the house today. She smells like our pool on a hot day. Her family knows the white trash way. I shared a, bath, a bedroom and two twin beds with my divorced mother. No one could ever come up to my room and play. No one could stay for supper. No one could spend the night. I was not allowed to have friends in the car. Get into an accident and the parents could sue us. We're not the Rockefellers, you know. After a whole more to the story, I moved out at 19, decorated my own apartment, lived there for nine months, lost my job, then chose the first of mistake men. But I never went home again. Sorry for the downer there, but uh, I may as well finish it with one more downer and then a humorous poem. So this one is called Father's Day or Dreams and Lies. I dreamed you back for years behind my rapid eye movements. We walked hand in hand in my childhood behind stage four sleep. You told me family stories held me when I hurt, taught me how to ride a bike, drive a car, to fall in love with men like you, subconsciously perfect. In daydreams, I rehearsed what I'd say when you claimed me from my lost and found life. I believed you had answers to questions I asked for years. Then I met you in the flesh and I abruptly awakened learning the difference between dreams and lies. Okay, as I promised, um, a more fun poem. Um, this is about my first job. Cream donut box, counter girl, 17, in at 6 a.m., out at noon. Old men order, coffee, regular, fry cake, cruller, Apple fritter, honey, sweetie, girly. Give me a smile. You got a boyfriend? I never minded. Their retired eyes twinkled. The men would sit close on metal stools, drink coffee and refills, joke and laugh, trade workday work memories when the factories ran round the clock all those years on the line. We counter girls gave them a smile, extra cream and sugar, upgrade to a fritter on the house when the boss stepped out. Sure, Joe, your refill's coming. Nah, I'll wipe the spill, Larry. Cup got in the way of your elbow. Sure was a funny story. Sunday mornings, they came in with their wives, fresh from church. Dozen to go. No, honey, sweetie girly. Their eyes downcast, wives handling the cash, their coats buttoned high. I loved my job, all but Sundays. And now we have our next poet, uh, Jennifer Maloney, who is comes to you from my hometown, Rochester, New York. Thank you. Diane, that was wonderful. Um, gosh, I enjoyed hearing uh, about things that I'm still enjoying here. Abbott's frozen custard. I haven't been to uh, Seabreeze in a while, but I, I also love that roller coaster. So that was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to start uh, my set because it's Pride Month um, with two poems that I wrote. Um, that appeared in subsequent volumes of Image Outright, which is the uh, anthology um, that's part of the Image Out Festival, uh, which is the uh, LGBTQ film festival, I believe, um, based here in Rochester. Um, Image Outright is uh, the anthology that's a part of that 
festival. The first poem in this section. Oops, I'm trying to drop all my stuff. That might not work. <laughs> this is called How Long. At the coffee house on South, I wait for you and she. I drink tea made of sweet red flowers and I don't smoke the cigarette I want to smoke that I haven't smoked for six years now. It's been four months and a new girl since I've seen you. Is that enough? Because I'll wait for four more months, a year, another girl or boy, a pack of cigarettes, another summer, winter, spring, a novel, a new poem, a bowl of fruit. I'll wait a wedding, a birth. I'll wait a war, a pestilence, a new administration, a sun and a moon and a long rainy day, a text message, an email. I'm not good at it, but I'm practiced. If you come tonight, open the door, walk in, pull out her chair, order a dirty chai and smile. Sit down next to me, close enough to touch, like you're my friend, my friend who taught me waiting is nearly just the same as love. It's close enough, close enough to touch as your fingers square tipped and blunt as truth sweep across her face like the hands of a clock, caress her chin, kiss the red flower of her mouth. I turn my face toward the street, watch the unending stream of passing cars, the ancient burning stars following their courses. Down the street, a church bell chimes, and like all changeless things, I wait. Thank you. That was in volume seven of Image Outright. And this one was uh, in volume eight. It's called The Moon in June. And there is an epigraph. Uh, this was from a user called Juan Pa on Twitter. And he said, or, or they said, to anyone who is upset that LGBTQ people stole the rainbow, rain itself is next, soon to be followed by the sun. The moon is already a lesbian. The moon is plainly trans, clearly queer. The moon knows what it is to move from phase to phase, growing fuller or leaner, to change. The moon is fluid and never just one thing or another. Why would anyone expect the moon to only ever be full or new? The moon is non-binary, exists on a spectrum, dresses strictly in evening wear, silver or black, unless drifting, crushing, an Esther Williams-inspired white bathing cap and sky blue swim, swim ensemble, winking a come-hither smirk at Golden Boy's sun. Oh, elegant moon dangling Venus from one ear, the least understated piece of jewelry in the universe. You're a queen. You stalk heaven like a runway. Drag the Milky Way behind you, the most fabulous of boas. Thank you. Um, I asked Shantae to share some links to a book that I co-edited and that was published 
in April of this year. Oops, it's called <laughs> Moving Images, uh, Poetry Inspired by Film. It is an anthology from poets around the world responding to film, actors, movies that have moved them. Um, and I'd like to read a piece uh, from that book that I wrote. And this is called uh, James Dean Goes Shopping. It's from a photo of the actor in a grocery store in Marfa, Texas, uh, taken during the shooting of his last film, Giant. James Dean, perusing shelves of Miller High Life and Campbell's Soup. James Dean, contemplating packaged pasta. James Dean, in sharp-toed shoes, white chinos, madras shirt, unbuttoned to the belly crease. Sweet slice of man chest on display, rolled up sleeves, empty of smokes. Why does he wear sunglasses in the store? Why does he carry a bag, not a basket? Make like you're still shopping, James, shouts the fan, or the studio-employed photographer snapping candids. And James obliges, neck of the sack crumpled in his right palm, magazine curled in his left, waits, obedient as a child, for another small moment of his life to be taken, for his real life to start unspooling again, for Witheritch, just off camera, laughing at the big movie star who causes a commotion buying toilet paper. In a moment, they will step outside, James will fish the fresh pack of Luckies from the bag and light one, hop into the Porsche, pop the top from a cold Coke, slide it between his thighs, grip it snug for the drive to Salinas. He won't spill a drop till he gets where he's going. Thank you. Um, it's Father's Day. Uh, as Diane mentioned, I dropped my phone, so I'm not going to read that poem, <laughs> but I have another one. This was for my father. Um, from uh, an episode, I think it was the first episode of um, atrial fibril fibrillation that he um, uh, endured. Um, and this is called at Unity Hospital, Autumn 2015. This piece was published in a collection called Shift, a publication of um, MTSU Wright. MTSU is a Middle Tennessee State University. At Unity Hospital, Autumn 2015. My favorite color is the color of your eyes when they are closed, a color I have to close my eyes to see. My favorite color is the color of the sun after the 2 a.m. hospital when all the other reds and yellows are only piss and blood. My favorite color is the color of the lake in this picture from 40 years ago. You are standing, squinting, grinning, under willow trees, under a hat bleached to no color at all except the silver of a hundred flashy lures and my favorite color is the color of a large mouth bass hanging heavy from your index finger, drooping, dripping, the color of algae, earthworms, and night. My favorite color is the color of your hospital gown. Your favorite color is green, the color of life. I watch a sunrise, the color of the parking lot. Other patients come, go, splintered bones, splintered, close calls, caught like fish, gasping and green, 
with another day on this blue earth. My favorite color is the color of the insides of my eyelids when I'm sleeping. When I dream, you fish and the brilliant dragonflies, electric blue and hot broad red skin, a lake, a color of summer air, tempting great green bass to the surface. They swim through eternity, take the bait like a promise. You jerk the line, set the hook, let them run. So soon they tire, and you laugh like a god reeling them in. Pull them, green, from the blue. Lay them in their white belly rows, trailing smears of blood and sparkling mucus on a wide and empty beach which is my very favorite color, the color I must close my eyes to see. That's for my father. Um, I think I'm going to read uh, one poem from class. Um, this is the class that Diane and I kind of met in, although she and I are in a poetry group together. I met Diane in class with Craig Cherry. Um, and this uh, poem is actually also published, uh, and it's published in an online uh, journal called um, Stop Talk. So I'm going to try to end with this. I hope I don't go over, Robert. I'll do my best. Stop Talk. I heard the commotion last night, the panic, the screams, watched you flung from the window at the edge of this bean field where I too am planted. I stood sturdy, for beans are brave. Saw your ascendance, your first small greenness poke up fast, spread and rise unleashed from this earth like a howl streaming skyward. Already, Giant leaves billow like sails and fruit the size of sailing ships swells from an exuberance of tendrils running out in all directions. You enchant me, your stalk thick as a trunk, your blossoms untwist open orange throats, standing stamens wink with pert attention above lolling petal tongues. You deity, your body could feed them all. The starvelings that tossed you like trash into this field, the village, the kingdom itself with your fruit, plump and sweetening in the sun. They could harvest today what might nourish them for years, save your seeds, plant your progeny, grow giant beans forever. Just in case, though, my lovely, my beautiful beanstalk, in case they are stupid, don't realize what you offer, see you only as a monster, a curiosity, something to use to get them somewhere, to something they can never eat. Swing one gorgeous, drowsy, nodding flower head above me. Drizzle some of your magic golden dust down here. Who are we kidding? These fools won't bring baskets. Just an ax. Kiss me now. I'll keep the secret of your love until next year when they'll all have killed each other off in pursuit of golden eggs and singing harps. When summer comes again, our huge-headed babies will sprout from our rot and butterflies and ravens will feast. Kiss me now, my whole vine shimmies at the thought. Thank you. And now, Robert Sullivan. Hey, everybody. I am indeed Robert O'Sullivan. And uh, that was Jennifer Maloney. And that is a voice uh, uh, that belongs on a books on tape or perhaps a spoken word CD. Um, beautiful, gorgeous, etheric poetry voice. I loved it. 
I'm going to open with an invocation. Uh, this is published in the Walt Whitman Bicentennial uh, Anthology. It was called Poets to Come, uh, www200.com. And uh, my, so my poem is called Spirit Song of Walt Whitman, A Rhapsody. These sunlit tree high vault of sky faultless poems these spared the rod and spoilt lyric ink spilt children of waltz salt of the earth and water birch wood place of birth this knotted paper bark voice this boisterous bravado camarado begging choice the voice of a reasonable god uncloistered in love perfect love, undefiled love, child of wildwood rejoicing in blue sky nakedness. This awakening duality of sexuality, this spontaneous, this subcutaneous, this seditious, wish-fulfilling fisherman, prophet, poet, knowingly wrote of it, the boy trollops dollop of delight, the same that served both muse and prostitute alike, with trembling fingers dared, palms pressed in supplicant prayer, gray-haired Mr. Whitman with his bristle brush, twig and blade bearded, Mr. Whitman bathing with the wren and thrush, Daisy tripping, unchastened, skinny dipping, waist deep in sweet water dripping, manly, fervid words. Mr. Whitman in a cloud of bumblebees, counselor to the birds. Mr. Whitman in his grove of hickory trees, traced back generations, both his father and his father before him, native. American heart and halcyon, hidden away song of myself, this body electric subconscious collective song of ourselves. This is a song for Walt Whitman who dreamed the poets after him. The scope and breadth would steal his breath had he still breath within him. Ah, but he moves among us still. He always will. This song is to the spirit of Walt Whitman the weight of an uncivil world laid down upon him, came home to die, cardboard butterfly, now witness to his specimen brilliance, came home to die, hand-painted butterfly, forever witness to his specimen brilliance. Walt Whitman, 1819 to 1892. Uh, so I'm going to read now a poem. This is, uh, this is just summertime. Um, this is uh, leaving California some, for some place that's just a lot greener and wetter and, um, and just more joyous uh, in summer. It's called From a Heartland Kind of Place. Come now away from it all. The noise and distress, hard press of numerous nuisances, the loosing of too much mouth loud madness upon our house crowded mountains and coastlines. Sadness strip mines its way deep into our faith lost years and tears blur our vistas, eyes burned by overload of construction crane and quarry in our overwhelmed deserts, our superheated cities. Turn away then, leave it all behind, the nerves and shaking, the heart aching, the pulsing peopled places, and come with me to these wide open spaces of heartland. All this leafy tree sweetness in blue shady groves, crow and cicada woven against wet washed clouds, below in rain green acred spreads, egg white farmhouses on broad lawn carpets with milk cream fences, dense with big red roses by big red rivers that overrun their banks, that course and swallow and carve out mud red valleys that run like broke open wounds after heavy thunder. Small wonder that here in the middle of nowhere country, junction grocers still sell grape at sodas and pork cracklins and keep candy bars for sale in their icebox still advertise weekly specials with blue magic marker on white newsprint, which runs and smears indecipherable after every single rain shower, that still plays Roger Miller's King of the Road and Gene Pitney's 24 Hours from Tulsa, that still plays the Statler Brothers, Pride of Stanton, Virginia, on their jukebox. 
Here, the best bargains down in the riverfront commercial block are priceless handmade quilts conceived at church socials, traced out on morning's kitchen tables and stitched on by arthritic hands late into night darkness, labored on for over more than a year and then sell for pennies on the dollar. Here we lay beneath flowering mimosas, hummingbird feathered and drowning fragrant after warm summer rain. Here we hide in spicy walnut woods below massive horse chestnut parks marked by ubiquitous wood white crosses. Here at church next to everything. Here at church held inside anything, even corrugated tin roof warehouses. And today a hot southern sun beats down upon the damp heads of the face of Christ fanning worshipers, hemmed senseless for hours on end until the streets outside mercilessly begin to melt. Tonight, just before sunset, I watched a group of preteen townies bunched together on the bank of the sweltering branch, conducting their secretive rituals beneath rusted railroad trestles. Suddenly they look up, shout at me, hey, you ain't nothing you need to be looking at down here. Get on now before we chase you all the way back to the county line. And I smile broadly at safe distance, yell back at them, ah, oh, don't pay me no heed. I just wanted to take a picture of your river, that's all and I hold up my camera for them to see. But then just for fun, real quick, like I zoom in on their red sweaty faces, focus and shoot. They see the flash from down below, start into cursing me as I cross over to the far side of the river, which is also the county line, which is also where I left the car. I roar off into heartland dusk, watching them in my rear view mirror shake fists in a cloud of creek gravel and dust. I watch them fade into the dark with all the envy and heart swell. Only an old, aged man driving through cricket song with all the windows rolled down, singing along to the country oldies can muster. Smoking cigarettes and watching Captain Kangaroo. Now don't tell me I've nothing to do. All right. You can just imagine where that might be. There's lots of states away from here, away from the Pacific coast and the desert states that look like that and feel like that. I'm going to uh, read a poem now that will remind you of when we used to be able to go to rock concerts, well, concerts of any type, and uh, just sit close and uh, sing along to our favorite singers and light our lighters for an encore and all the good stuff. We uh, hopefully are going to be doing that again real soon, maybe even later this summer. Uh, this is called I Am in Ricky Lee Love. Oh man, I am in Ricky Lee Love all over again, being preached the gospel of all things by her most high loving Jonesness. Oh, let's hope she looks down on us from the mic, down on me and Jem in the third row with tigers sleeping in the aisles, pirates sailing the deepest blue mezzanine, ghost coats on the wire hanging with skeletons in the dressing room closet, and cowboy poets taking flight like holy bead angels, like holy doves. Oh, holy love, man. She is the truest gospel made from the same mud as she is the Christ who joins the tour band to get her mercy message out to all us impoverished FM dialers. And she is the Christ who is dropped by her agency. She is the Christ who gets thrown out on the streets by her landlord, and she is the Christ who busks on wooden benches outside boardwalk nightclubs, making just enough spare change for her smokes, her guitar strings, and her daily bread. And she is the Christ who sleeps outside with the homeless, the diseased, the drunks, and all the other time-honored prophets. And she is the Christ who is harassed by the cops for smelling so badly. And she is the Christ who gets locked up for acting like the crazy woman that she is, scaring away the tourists on the beach. And by 
God, don't you just know that she is the Christ who would have gotten her love all confused, her love all mixed up in the who gets it and who shouldn't, and where it's okay to sleep and where it's just too dangerous, and begging Blessed Mother to heal her from the heartbreak just beneath her skin, and begging Heavenly Father for one more chance, oh one just please Father, I'll do anything you ask, last chance beneath the priests, beneath the robes, beneath the sky, beneath the cold, beneath the trees, the boulevard, the bars, the freeway cars, the turned off, burned out, graffiti scarred, smog charred, far off, all alone, Texaco star. And that was uh, for Ricky Lee Jones. Hopefully you were able to figure that out. Um, what a goddess, huh? Uh, let's see. How am I doing? Okay, I am going to read a summer solstice poem. And we've got solstice coming up in just about uh, three days. I think it's on the 20th this year at uh, like 11 p.m. at night. Some, don't quote me, but something like that. This is called Day of the Green Man. It's pretty short. See the women hanging the green stalks upside down, the wort, the laurel, and the heliotrope tied off with dyed cord and placed alongside crystals and mirrors to capture the long light of the waxing sun. They spread herbs out for drying and stir their pots of summer stews. On midsummer night, the men bring shells and stones, not fish or meats. The animals are protected at this time in favor of magic amulets. Light and dark intertwine as stars begin to punctuate the deepening blue. Now watch them raise their skirts to jump the bale fire, their eyes wild, the air around them filled with wings and feathers, spirits they cannot see, but whose presence they feel. Their inflamed skin longs for expansion, growth. They are obsessed with fertility tonight, before the oak king returns to reclaim his piece of the sky. Yes, happy summer solstice, uh, everybody. Um, I think that does it for me. I've just got a few minutes left to let you know that uh, San Diego County is definitely a vacation destination. So should you find yourself in San Diego, uh, drop me a line and I'll hook you up with a, a poetry reading that you can attend uh, somewhere in the city, maybe even one that I run, which is up in Escondido. We're about 30 minutes north of uh, San Diego. You can find me on Facebook by going to Poets Inland North County. It's Poets Inc, I-N-C, but it stands for Inland North County, which is actually target on the map where we are. You can also go to YouTube and just type in Poets Inland North County, and you can uh, check us out there as well. Uh, we've been uh, I have that uh, open reading now since uh, about 2005, and it's still going strong. Uh, we are starting up actually next month, um, post-pandemic. All righty, I'm going to turn this now over to Elijah, and enjoy, please. Hello, everyone. Greetings from, actually, I'm in Sumter, South Carolina. I'm not actually in Philadelphia right now, so I just want to say hello to everyone. And uh, just a little bit about myself before I start reading. Um, I think one of the things I like to talk about is my philosophy about poetry. And it starts with a quote that says, poetry out of anger is the easiest thing to write. Poetry out of understanding is the hardest thing to accomplish. So uh, that is Elliot Pearson. And that has been my philosophy. I've always wanted to tell my story not by hitting people over the head, but by either nudging them or slapping them real hard, whatever it is to get their attention. But when you hit people over the head with your message, you leave them unconscious. So with that being said, I'll start my first piece, which is a quick song. Light beams down and bends at my bed, runs across the cover and stripes my head. The shade is torn by the dawn's early light. God bless the church being wasn't out late last night. America, America, 
land of grime, America, America, full of crime, sweet land of poverty, to the I sing, to the I sing, talking cars full of promises and lies, this idealism will exhaust alibis, slum surviving but so proudly we hail, big brother's happy cause he knows he hasn't failed, America, America, a chicken in every pot, America, America, each man makes his lot. Sweet land of hypocrisy, to thee I sing, to thee I sing. The window symbols as the trolley drum rolls. My bed rocks rattling, ting my soul. And the gunshots are the bombs bursting in air. See the dead soldiers slinging all over the stairs. America, America, I'll fight in thee. America, America, watch me bleed. Sweet land of morbidity, sweet land of hypocrisy, sweet land of poverty. To thee I sing, to thee I sing. One of the things I like to do with my poetry is to tell the story. This is about segregation. We know the segregation is not good, but I also want to talk about the triumph. And this one is entitled, Dina Knows Two Letters. She couldn't read, but she knew that grandma with her mania and wisdom began with her favorite letter, W. One U arm in arm with another U, just like her and grandma walking. Two U's are far stronger than one. Working together, they do miracles, changing vowels into a consonant. W has powers. W is for whites. She sees W, so she's no longer thirsty. W, she doesn't even have to go to pee. Another W, and she ain't hardly hungry. It's a superhero letter that takes away the need for water, bathroom, food. She is so smart and only three years here. W means no. C is we. So now she drinks. The next poem um, is, well, I'll just do it. It's 5153 Christopher Street. The Stonewall Riots, NYC, June of 69, and the LGBT is born, pushed into birth near Canal Street, born of short-haired women and long-haired men. This is not hedonism or Gomorrah. No, this is discovery on Christopher Street. Friday evening, the 27th, we resisted the planned extinction. The passageway erupts like water breaking, and the afterbirth is the expulsion of helplessness. This marks the beginning of our identity and the commencement of warfare, war on discriminatory practices, war on oppressive actions, war on building closets. We, the oxymoron, soft men, hard women, fight for a peace, a peace to be in our right mind. In lowercase letters. In large magical letters, LGBT or LGBTQ or any other letter that wishes to join. And he writes the disease, human immunodeficiency virus and small insignificant minuscule letters, HIV. To him, it has no power. Even though people forget to be human, showing their deficiency, which has now gone viral. Um, as an artivist, which is what I like to call myself, I'm always dealing with um, those who are forgotten. And one of the things about people who are homeless is that if you're homeless, then that means your child will probably not receive a decent education. So this actually was published in an international anthology. It was 99 poets for the 99%. And this one is entitled Homeless Because. He is homeless because he failed math. He couldn't figure out how to divide one paycheck and to four hungry children. He could only add to his mounting bills. He could only subtract opportunities. He should have studied how to multiply options. She is homeless because she failed English. She is a pronoun. It is used instead of a noun. Nouns are places, people, things, or ideas. She has no place. People have abandoned her, and the thing is food. 
but she has no idea from where. Children are homeless because sons and daughters failed biology, not knowing a zygote from ain't God, snuggle beneath their father's musky armpits. She perspires worry about his children slumbering on his shoulder, comforted by the stench, knowing daddy is near. They are homeless because they failed political science. So hard to trace boundaries and remember political parties when you're not at the festivities. Franklin's New Deal does not have the urgency of the raw deer they have been dealt. Cards pulled from the bottom of the deck, but homeless is not hopeless. And they have failed political science, biology, English, and math. But has society failed humanity? This is um, sort of a disguised poem. It's about, it's not a, it isn't about what it seems to be about. And this one is called Land and Water. Land that cuts water, isthmus. Water that cuts land, river. Water surrounds land, island. Land surrounds water, lake. An island and a lake means isolation. Should the shore come to the sea or should I swim to the shore? But arms cannot reach the beach. I cannot land where you stand. Now I rest on a bed, a cradle of rocks and tears. My soul has been cut by water and land. Uh, the next few pieces that I want to share um, one is about the insurrection, and I think that people are looking at the insurrection that occurred um, in a too black and white way. And I think that we have to understand where we are on this. And I think the last line of this poem really tells us who we really are. And this is called Who They Are. On this morning, in this moaning, through this mournful first light, I view the insurrection. I thank God that I also see people scared, unable to share this America, who feel as fervently as faith to untie is the same as unite. When ice push and back up the tea, they do not listen to the queen, otherwise they would know U-N-I-T-E-Y. What is it to fear? Riot of trepidation. The fishmonger peddles to them that we are the dreaded piranha, the dreaded pariah in the water, and the convocation is convinced they will be preyed upon, so they say grace before they eagerly eat the bait, only to find it is not easily consumed, nor does it end the pangs of a belly, bloated with misinformation and dread. Call them deplorable, or is it their condition or their conditioning? How do they fearlessly face the uncertainty and the realization there is only an illusion of power and the one they have seen beset? Will they exercise demons back to them? Will they mimic their action of abuse or their lack of action, complacency, apathy? Will they? They worry, will they? not knowing they are both they. I'd like to share a poem uh, about North Philadelphia. Ponds, a synonym for hope. There are ponds that find themselves in North Philadelphia. They find their way home in spite of the cement the asphalt, in spite of the buildings closing around them. There are ponds that find their way to North Philadelphia every time rain gathers in corners. An altered terrain does not deter them from finding the natural topography. When the droplets collect, it comes instinctually. It is the earth breathing and breathing and teeming with the live. That is why ponds must find their way so we can know North Philadelphia before it was Philadelphia, before it was North, 
there are pines that find us North Philadelphians. They find their way to us through cement and asphalt to reconstitute us after being concentrated. And the last piece I like to share is we heal ourselves. Starts with an epigraph. How often do we get stuck in there where we were only supposed to pause and catch our breath before proceeding? Soon Reza. A sage is a profound philosopher, um, distinguished for wisdom. And now my poem. Cherish your failures, befriend and confide in them as you would a sage. In return, they will, if you listen carefully, whisper their secrets, teach you the how to, how to try again, how to find the right path, how to understand they are only a detour, not a cul-de-sac, that they will measure but a moment in our life and not define it. Allow them to point, direct us to their purpose, our introspection. The chance to flourish when we behold our feelings cause them to concede to our toil to never slacken in our true effort a breath of purpose. Yes, this is the time, the spell when we heal ourselves with resiliency. And with this re healing, we enthusiastically should seek encounters, challenges that verse us to triumph again and again and once more. Yes, we heal ourselves. From the day we are, from the day we are, twins greet us, life and death. One takes us on a path, on a path that eventually lead to the other. Life and death, death and life, life and death, death and life. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. And bravo to Jennifer, Robert, and Diane who preceded me. Thank you once again. And thank you uh, to our wonderful wonderful trio of poets this evening. Um, hope everyone enjoyed them. Um, marvelous voices and just so inspiring. I just, I just have to say that. Uh, next month for July, we will have Adrian Just the Pen Tombs. We will have uh, David Michael Nixon. And we will have uh, Don Kolinga Lees. And um, join us again next month, the third Thursday at 7 p.m. And thank you for watching. And thank you, Yuba Sutter Arts and Culture, for um, sponsoring this program. And thank you very much and have a good evening.